Yep, thanks so, for reminding me. Yeah, and then don't forget to, oh, you're recording already. Okay, I was gonna say, don't forget to hit record. <laughs> I'm making you a co-host and I'm stopping the recording because this is a very interesting. Okay. So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our library community forum. Thanks for joining us. I am Paula Beswick, a forum committee member, and I'm happy to be part of the Bozeman Public Library Civic Engagement Programming. As always, I am joined by dedicated committee member C.D. Happel, our committee chair, Ann Banks, Roger Breeding, Eva Patton, Dick Young, and librarian Beth Boyson. Beth, Beth gets a special thanks for being our intrepid tech guru. Library committee forums offer interest-driven and thought-provoking programming on the third Wednesday of each month, September through May, supported by the Bozeman Public Library Foundation. Another upcoming virtual forum for civil discourse is the seventh symposium titled, How Are You Holding Up? The Pandemic's Wide-Ranging Effects on Mental Health. Join the library's panel of mental health and public health experts as they discuss loneliness, anxiety, grief, and resilience in the era of COVID-19. This will be moderated by our new city commissioner, Christopher Coburn, Coburn excuse me. Christopher works as the system manager for community health, uh, community improvement and partnerships with Bozeman Health. He also serves on the Gallatin City County Board of Health and is a member of the mm -hmm. Gallatin COVID-19 Vaccine Distribution Task Force. Symposium, as you can see, is in very good hands. The program is on March 13th, 7 o'clock to 8.30 p.m., and it's accessed via a Zoom link on the library's web events calendar. Coincidentally, May 13th is also not just the symposium, but also the last day of the Montana legislative session in Helena. For a look back on what happened in Helena, please join us again online on May 19th for our final library community forum before starting back up again in September. The forum will feature the editor of Montana Free Press, Brad Tyre, along with his reporters covering everything legislative related. You won't want to miss this 2021 legislature wrap up. What passed, what failed, what difference does it make? Again, that's virtually at noon on May 19th. Zoom link is available on the library's website if you go to their events calendar, just like you found this one. As an attendee on this Zoom, you are muted without access to your camera, but we invite you to type your questions into the Q&A function at any time during the presentation. I will monitor these throughout the program and pose as many of your questions to our guests as time allows. As a reminder, we are being recorded for KGVM and will be archived on the library's YouTube page. Now I'm looking forward to a conversation with Lisa Upson, Director of People and Carnivores, and Mike Phillips, Director of the Turner Endangered Species Fund, to discuss the multifaceted perils facing wildlife in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Lisa has worked in large carnivore conservation for 15 years with a focus on grizzly bear and wolf coexistence. She has also worked as a mediator and taught public administration at the University of Montana. She received her master's in public, in public administration at MSU. Mike Phillips is the co-founder and director of the Turner Endangered Species Fund. His work has included the reintroduction of gray wolves to Yellowstone National Park in 1995 and 96, and working with the Obama administration in the US Senate to pass clean energy jobs and climate change legislation. Mike is also a former Montana legislature legislator working from 2006 to 2020. Well, once again, I'm astounded by the expertise found right here in the Gallatin Valley. And I welcome my friends, Lisa and Mike to this forum. We'll start with Lisa, followed by Mike, finishing up with your question and answer period. Lisa, do you ready to take it away? Thank you, Paula. And thanks to the Bozeman Public Library Community Forum for hosting this event about wildlife conservation and coexistence. Um, I am happy to be here, honored to be next to Mike Phillips in this discussion. Um, 
Wildlife conservation and coexistence is a big topic and an important one because our landscapes around us are becoming more crowded every day. In this region, certainly um, post pandemic and during the pandemic, it has gotten so much more crowded. And even before that, it was one of the fastest growing regions in the country. So this is one of the reasons why uh, wildlife conservation is about coexistence today so much. And um, my own view is that wildlife policy laws and regulations are so difficult to change in the direction of being more protectionist for wildlife. Um, <clears throat> most of the policies today favor people and property or protect people and property. And so wildlife needs our help. Um, so <clears throat> there are a lot of coexistence needs out there from marine animals to birds. And today we're gonna focus on um, land mammals here in the Northern Rockies region, particularly um, my organization, People and Carnivores, focuses on conservation and connectivity for large carnivores, wolves, grizzly bears, black bears, and mountain lions. And so <clears throat> People and Carnivores has two basic conservation goals. One is to protect large carnivores so that they survive, of course, and keep moving so that they connect with others and other populations. When wildlife um, connects with others and other populations, um, we get healthy populations and we get healthy ecosystems. So we want them to be able to interact with others of their species. Our other basic conservation goal is to help grizzly bears walk into central Idaho. Central Idaho is home to the Bitterroot ecosystem and it's a grizzly bear recovery zone but it has no grizzly bears. And it's the largest wilderness complex in the lower 48 states. And so it should have grizzly bears. They're native to the area. Um, we want them there and we want them to ideally recolonize central Idaho naturally. And so we're trying to help them do that. Um, so we focus our efforts in Western Montana, excuse me, my nose is dripping. Um, it's an ecologically rich area, and it happens to be located in between three major core habitat areas. One, of course, is the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Another is the glacier area, or what's called the crown of the continent. And then, as I mentioned, central Idaho. And so wildlife needs to be able to cross and move and reside in areas of Western Montana to be able to connect with others in those source populations or those core habitat areas. And so that's a mix of public and private lands, private lands with um, a, you know, some development, lots of ranches, farms, and uh, recreationists on public lands. Um, and <clears throat> so um, it's, it's not easy. Um, I want to show you now a short video clip that I think will begin to answer the question of why it's so difficult for wildlife um, to move around. And so I'm going to do a quick screen share here. And you should be looking at a grizzly bear standing up in a corn crop. And this is located about an hour north of Missoula. And it could be located pretty much anywhere in western Montana. So I'm going to play this now and you can see the grizzly bear is moving around like a periscope trying to see whether it's safe to come out of that corn, especially because she's got two yearling cubs in tow. And so she's running now um, because she's feeling insecure. Part of that is because she's exposed and her cubs are exposed. Of course, she knows that someone's standing there videotaping this as well, but you can see the houses in the background. You can see the barns. So this is an area uh, where people are located. It's a rural community. And she's trying to safely get her cubs across this open area. So she finds another way to get into the other side of the corn crop here. Um, if we could just get her cubs to, to move along here. And here they come. One of them decides maybe to turn back. Nope, that's not a good idea. And so they, they, they find some more security in the other side of the corn crop, but it's not a great place to be because bears love corn and they eat corn, um, which does not help the social tolerance of uh, grizzly bears in particular. 
So that's just one example of what's happening every day and every night for wildlife in this region. They're moving around. They naturally do uh, move around even within their home ranges. And, um, and, even, and they like to expand their territory, especially males like to disperse out of their um, home ranges. And they move around looking for food. They move around looking for mates, just as my cat is walking in front of my screen right now. Um, and so what happens is they get in trouble with hazards on the landscape as they travel. Um, we call these attractants and it can be anything from a fruit orchard, a chicken coop, a beehive, uh, livestock, crops, garbage. And <clears throat> when large carnivores, when wolves and bears and cougars get tied up in these things, um, they are often killed. And that is uh, particularly the case when they get tangled up with um, livestock and with, of course, human beings. Um, and also for bears, garbage, because large carnivores will always seek the easiest meal. It's hard for them to make a living out there. And so if they come across something that is easy for them, they're going to um, look to eat that thing. And then they, were, they will try to do that again and again, and they become food conditioned and they become habituated to being around people. So they often wind up, um, they wind up dead. So, so my organization, People and Carnivores, we work to prevent these things from happening. Um, we want to keep them moving so that they can travel and they can connect with others and also expand their range, as I mentioned before. There are two main ways that we do that. One is we try to remove the attractants where possible. We partner with landowners. We can do simple things like put the garbage away, put it in a canister, put it in a secure building, a garage, something like that. We can uh, move livestock if we know there's a wolf den in the area. But more often, uh, we need to implement tools on the ground to separate uh, wolves and bears from those attractants. So if we just prevent access to those risky attractants, those, those unnatural food sources, um, you know, that at least keeps them moving. And we can do that using tools like range riders, guardian dogs, scare devices, fencing solutions, and, and other things. So <clears throat> I want to share my screen here again and show you some examples of this. It's sort of hard to imagine what this stuff looks like and how it works. So let me do that here now. So what you're looking at now are some guardian dogs. And livestock guardian dogs have been used for a long, long time in other countries, and it's, um, they're newer to this country. Um, and that dog on the left is two or three years old and is bonded to the cattle uh, behind him. And the pups, those are actually pups on the right, um, are in the process of bonding to livestock right now. They are um, dogs that we uh, placed at a ranch in Southwest Montana um, just this year, a couple months ago. And so how this works, um, the dogs bond to the livestock. And then when, if a bear or a wolf comes around, they basically haze them off. And so they chase them. And it doesn't sound like much, but they're very effective. Another um, set of tools that we use are called scare devices. And scare devices, this, this one that you're looking at here is a fox light. And fox lights, um, let me get this going here. They send off random lighting patterns. And these are nice tools because they're inexpensive, they're easy to set up, and they scare off large carnivores. Um, what happens is the wildlife, they, they sense that there are humans in the area because they equate this lighting with um, human presence. And they're very effective, surprisingly. The other scare device that we use is called a critter getter. And the critter getter works um, similarly, but it's an acoustic device and it sends off noises uh, if a wild carnivore comes in within a certain distance of it. So those are great tools. <clears throat> we do a lot of fencing. 
fencing is probably our most common solution to keep wild carnivores um, from accessing unnatural food sources. And here at this ranch in Southwest Montana, we're going to build a night pen around sheep. And the reason that we're doing that um, in part is this animal that's walking into the frame right now, a mountain lion going into the pasture where at this time there was no livestock, which was good. But there are sheep out there and they're very vulnerable and there are um, not only cougars in this area, but wolves and bears as well. So we're gonna build a night pen to protect the sheep, um, but we can put temporary electrified fencing around almost anything, chicken barns, chicken coops, fruit orchards, beehives, um, bigger livestock pastures, um, garbage, if there's a whole bunch of garbage in one area. Um, so fencing, um, we use quite a bit. It's electrified usually, and we do that with solar power. And um, it's temporary, and it's not that expensive. It's We can move it around and reuse it, so that's a great solution. One type of fencing that people like to learn about is called fladry. And you're looking at fladry here, you're looking at our field director installing this fladry at a ranch in Northwest Montana. And fladry is a great wolf deterrence. Um, again, it doesn't look like much, but wolves are wary of these flags that move gently, you know, in a breeze or just, they, they don't understand them. And so similar to scare devices, the wolves um, see these flags moving just a bit and they think that there are humans around or they're just not familiar with it. And it's been tested pretty widely. Um, it's not effective with bears or cougars. We have tested it with those species and um, it's pretty funny to watch because they sort of shrug their shoulders and they walk right through it. But for wolves, they are very wary of this these flags. And so, um, it deters them. One thing that's important about fladry is we only use it for about um, six weeks at a time because they will begin to get used to it and then um, become, uh, they, they try to test it eventually. Um, but this was a great success story. We put up the fladry. There had been um, wolf depredations on the cattle here in prior years and wolves had been killed in response to that. Um, because that's how it works. When there are these conflicts, then um, the carnivores are killed in response oftentimes. After we put the fladry up, um, there were no conflicts um, on either, and there were no losses on either side of the fence. There are a lot of um, solutions that can be used in, on public lands and in the backcountry as well. Here, you're looking at our guys hoisting what's called a bear pole. And these bear poles allow um, backpackers and hikers and hunters to hang food um, off the ground and a certain distance from those vertical trees so that bears can't access them. And it's a really effective solution. And uh, we've built about 250 of these bear poles um, across no the Northern Rockies um, public lands, a lot on forest service lands and also with the tribes. And what happens is it just prevents bears from accessing, again, foods that they shouldn't access and then becoming food conditioned and eventually getting in trouble. We also use bear boxes and um, develop loaner programs with the agencies so that people going into the backcountry can borrow certain equipment, coolers that are bear resistant, panniers for horses, um, and even fencing and. Um, containers for food. So I've mentioned garb and bar garbage a couple times. Garbage is a real problem for bears and it's becoming a huge issue um, in, this, in this region and really everywhere. Um, so this is a video that we, we had taken by a trail camera just a couple of weeks ago. This is a ranch um, in sort of the Eastern part of Western Montana. Uh, between Helena and Anaconda, if you know the area. And um, last year, this rancher had a grizzly get into some things. And so this year, uh, we helped the rancher get some livestock guardian dogs and also um, gave uh, him a couple of these bear resistant canisters. And so <clears throat> these bear resistant canisters, you can see the grizzly bear trying to get into it. 
And the bear's so big and look at those claws, just amazing. Um, that is not a small canister, so that's a big bear. Um, and this is a certified bear resistant canister. It's the uh, canister, it's a Toter brand. And we give these um, or cost share these with a lot of residents, ranches, farms. Inside this particular canister is the livestock guardian dog food. And so, you know, on ranches and farms, they use these things for a lot of different purposes. And so we want to keep bears um, away from those unnatural food sources. So the video stopped, but the bear did not get into the canister. Uh, those are great solutions. And we also, uh, these are bigger projects, but we work at um, refuse sites or garbage dumps to secure um, the places where people go to dump their garbage because in some of these rural communities out here, um, there's no trash pickup. And so there are these transfer stations or these refuse sites that everyone takes their garbage to and bears will get into them. So we work to secure those as well. And lastly, we can't forget uh, an image of wolves. This is another great story. These wolf pups were born last spring after years of a wolf pack being killed because they were uh, preying on cattle on this large ranch in Southwest Montana. And so we used guard dogs and some canisters and some fladry. It took some work, but we got the wolf pack to move back in and then they had pups the following spring, which was just fantastic. So these tools work, they work really well. And a lot of our work is about, um, you know, getting into the rural networks and helping people experiment, try these out a lot. Most of the time when people try them, then the neighbors try them. These rural networks are really strong peer-to-peer -peer networks. And so we're preventing conflicts so that wild carnivores can keep moving. Um, but perhaps more importantly, we're increasing the social tolerance for these animals and for wildlife in general, because when people are proactive instead of reactive, waiting for problems to happen, they sleep better, um, they accept these animals on the landscape, and we can all uh, work together to scale up this work um, even more across the region. So um, it's a great way to conserve wildlife um, especially in these rural areas, especially with these large mammals who are native to the, to the region. So I look forward to answering any questions that I can about um, uh, our work or this uh, approach to conservation. And I thank you for your attention. Thanks. Great. Oh, thank you, Lisa. That that was amazing. Those those videos. I'm so glad that you you decided to include them. Um, I know I was writing down questions, <laughs> so <laughs> we will come to those at the end. And again, I Great. encourage everybody to um, to put your questions in, and uh, we will ask those at the end of the um, of the presentation. And so now we're going to turn to. Mike Phillips, the uh, co-founder and director of Turner Endangered Species Fund. And we are thrilled to have you here with us, Mike. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you now. Yeah, Paula, thank you. It, it really is an honor to be here and to share this event with Lisa. Lisa, thank you so much for the great work being done by you and your team. Uh, it, it is uh, an honor for me to speak today on, Earth Day is here with us. And I would say that Team Turner, we hope to make every day Earth Day. And when I say Team Turner, I principally, principally mean the Turner Endangered Species Fund and Turner Biodiversity Divisions. Uh, Ted and I came together in 1995 and co-founded what was then and still is the most significant private effort in the world to give rise to efforts to arrest the extinction crisis through reintroduction projects that focus on imperiled species. Most of our work takes place in the continental United States, but we have done work in Russia and Poland and China and elsewhere around the world. Uh, Ted has a big intellectual appetite, a big appetite for sharing his good fortune. And we have been uh, able to enlist good scientists fundamentally around the world to advance these, these reintroduction projects. Uh, by themselves, they, they consist of small individual efforts that are stitched together every day to fundamentally make every day Earth Day. 
with a focus on arresting the extinction crisis. We would have you believe that no matter who you are, the extinction crisis should matter. We, we believe it is one of humanity's most pressing and least attended problems. If you are, for example, a person of faith, uh, how can you love the creation, or the love the creator and not love the creation? And how can you love something and not stand in defense of its protection when it's being needlessly harmed? Or conversely, let's assume for a moment that you're a, a secular humanist and you believe that rather than faith, it's facts and data and logic and empiricism that matter most. Well, the best science makes clear that the fate of humanity always has been and always will be a function of the health of local landscapes all around the world. And yet the extinction crisis makes clear that the landscapes aren't the least bit healthy and growing less so with each passing day. We think the extinction crisis is really the clarion call for readjusting our relationship with Mother Earth. And that readjustment is a function of small things done every day by individual people. So, so what I would like to do, rather than sit here and talk, I would rather share an important story of one person doing little things each and every day that add up to a big difference. Uh, Beth, if you could run that video, this portrays the work of Team Turner on the flying D. You know, this does not seem to be working. I mean, okay. I don't know if other people are having as hard a time. Yeah, I think, Paul. Beth, we should. There's yeah. a, yeah, I was going to say, there's a link to that video on Mountain Journal's um, webpage, and I would highly encourage everybody to go visit. That is a wonderful film. Um, well, let me stop it. I think it. we should probably. OK. Yeah, I think, thank you, Paul. I, I agree that it was turning into an exercise in frustration. And Val's work should be something to celebrate, not frustrate over. <laughs> but so let, let, right. me, let me continue. And you know, we, we can, yeah, we, we can share that. We can share that that uh, link yeah. with everybody that is on here and, and on the uh, library webpage. So everybody will have access to it. And I highly encourage everybody to go watch it. So, and, and let, the, the point was simple. The point is that each and every day Val goes out and she works to establish a, a new perspective on, on wild and self-willed nature. Through, through her work, we, we know through her work and the work of many others like Lisa and her shop, that coexisting with large carnivores is rather straightforward affair that requires only a modicum of accommodation. What gets in the way of coexistence? What gets in the way of accommodating wild and self-willed nature are our mythical beliefs that are not even shadows of reality. For example, with the gray wolf, there's only been one thing that has hindered gray wolf recovery, and that's the mythical wolf. This belief that the wolf possesses a supernatural ability to exercise its predatory will on a whim. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. For the gray wolf, each and every day is a struggle to survive. Each day, a gray wolf has to wake up and, and she's got to go to work. And for a gray wolf, going to work means putting on average seven to 10 pounds of sustenance in her belly. Now that they go many, many days without eating anything, but on average, they need to consume seven to 10 pounds of food each day to maintain good health and be able to be reproductively active. And yet, that is a very difficult endeavor. Hunting for gray wolves is a dangerous proposition that most of the time fails. Uh, all field studies of gray wolves reveal that most hunting attempts fail. Seven, eight times out of 10, a gray wolf comes up empty pawed. It's also a very dangerous proposition. Uh, I studied gray wolves in Alaska many years ago. I looked at the frequency of traumatic injuries to gray wolf skulls. These were animals that had been killed by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game in an attempt to minimize predation pressure on a local ungulate population, caribou or moose, for example. 
fully a quarter of the skulls showed evidence of blunt force trauma, broken nose, broken jaw, broken skull. It's very difficult making a living in the woods with your teeth. Gray wolves have two things going for them that tilt the balance in their favor. And they are a wildly successful life form. Historically, gray wolves are the most widely distributed large carnivore in North America. Uh, two things allow them to be so successful. They are doggedly determined. They wake up every night and they go to work. And they are supremely social. There's a Rudyard Kipling poem, Law of the Jungle. There are lines that read, the strength of the wolf is the pack and the strength of the pack is the wolf. Gray wolves are one of the most social large mammals in the world. Because of their determination and their keen sociality, they are wildly successful, but they are not what most people believe them to be. Uh, they are relatively easy to coexist with. They do not cause the problems that most people report. It to me is uh, most unfortunate that our state legislature, for example, as we speak, is working on bills based on this mythical wolf that coexisting with the species is a difficult affair. And the only way to succeed is to drive wolf numbers to a very, very low level. Other aspects of uh, accommodating wild and self-willed nature are also based on this notion that it's more difficult than it really proves to be. Each and every day, Team Turner sets out doing a thousand little things that together collectively comprise a big thing to make every day Earth Day. I hope all of the folks that are on this uh, Zoom webinar today will, in their own ways, try to make each and every day Earth Day. All that we've ever known, all of the great security that we've ever known is compliments of Mother Earth. It, it only makes sense that if we care about tomorrow and a more distant future, we take good care of her. Uh, Paula, I don't have really any other comments. I'm far more interested in the Q&A and what other folks think than sitting here and spouting off what I already know in my own head. So thank you for the chance to participate. And I look forward to listening and participating with the Q&A. Thank um, sorry, I, I was on mute there. Thanks so much, Mike, and sorry that we were not able to get that video working. Um, Beth has already uh, posted the link in the chat, so if everybody wants to um, has access to that, they can go and cut and paste that. And um, and again, you can find it on the Mountain Journal page, mountainjournal.org. Um, it's a beautiful film uh, made by Daniel Glick, who is a, a local filmmaker. <clears throat> but um, we do have some questions coming in. So, um, Mike, I'm going to start with you, and I have quite a few for Lisa as well. But um, with the, um, the this notion of the mythical wolf wolf that you talked about, Mike, and thinking about how uh, Montana has been in the national news lately, perhaps. Um, far too often uh, for things that we don't want, one of them being the wolf trapping incident with our governor, and then this recent um, grizz mauling and killing that happened um, of both the guide and the, the grizzly bear in West Yellowstone. And, uh, you know, this could be a question for both of you, but how does that impact your work when Montana is in this national news about coexisting with the wildlife here, particularly the, the large carnivores. And Mike, we can start with you. Oh, you're muted. It's quite, a, it's evidence that our work is not done. Clearly we haven't done the job that needs to be done to convince people that accommodating gray wolves is a straightforward affair. When you look at what the state legislature is doing, supported by Governor Gianforte, who clearly, uh, I think, is inclined to sign the bills, they make lawful, needless killing. There, there is no rational reason for killing hundreds of gray wolves in the state of Montana every year for recreational purposes. They would have you believe, they, the decision makers, that there are too many gray wolves in the state. And you could then fairly say, well, based on what? They don't have a good answer to that. They might say, well, the impacts to livestock are unacceptable. The data don't support that claim. 
They might say that the impact of wolf predation on local elk and deer populations is too pronounced. The data don't support that. They simply, the decision makers, do not hold in regard the lives of carnivores. Just very, very quickly, a little story that illustrates this, I think, clearly. In my last legislative session in 2019, I brought a little bill, a little bill. It was a bill that simply said, in the state of Montana, you can't torture coyotes to death. You can't torture coyotes to death by running them over with your snowmobile to kill them. You can still hunt them off snowmobiles. You can still kill unlimited numbers. You can still run the coyote to the point where it's so exhausted it lays on the ground and stares up at you, unable to take another step. But at that point, you have to kill it quickly, humanely. You can't use your snow machine to run it over repeatedly to ultimately take its life. The bill died in the Senate Fish and Game Committee, of which I was the ranking minority member, on a party line vote. I said, okay, fair enough. As was my right as any senator, I can make a motion to the full Senate to remove that bill from the standing committee so that the full Senate could hear it. It's called a blast motion. I intend to blast the bill from the committee so the big chamber, the entire Senate, can consider it. I went to my colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle and I said, I need your help. It's a procedural motion. I'm going to make a motion to remove that bill from the Senate Fish and Game Committee. I'm going to blast that bill. We need to have this discussion on the Senate floor. Please, at least, vote with me on this procedural step. On the proper day, I stood up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I moved to remove Senate Bill 211 from the Fish and Game Committee and place it in front of the full Senate tomorrow. At that point, I have a moment to explain why my motion makes sense. I said to the full Senate, if we knew of a young boy in our neighborhood who was using his bicycle to run over the neighbor, neighborhood's cats, we would be concerned for that boy's mental health. This is no different than that. Montana is better than torturing coyotes to death. That motion died on a party line vote. 18 Democrats said, yes, let's hear this bill. 32 Republicans, many of which I'd served with for many, many years, voted no. At that point, I'd had enough of their hypocrisy, Paul. I could no longer stand in prayer with them. Every day when the Senate convenes, we would do two things. Uh, we would pray and we would then pledge allegiance. Uh, from that point forward, I would step into the ante room quietly, politely, minding my own business until the prayer concluded and I'd step back in the chamber and pledge allegiance to the flag. The fact of the matter is too many of my Republican colleagues, all 32 of them in that particular case, seemingly have no value, place no value on the lives of, life of, of coyotes and the same would be said of things like gray wolves. What I find most shocking is that most of those senators would consider themselves people of faith. And that I'm quite certain that any God worth worshiping thinks highly of coyotes. Mm, well, thank you for your work um, trying. Lisa, what, uh, what's, uh, do you have any thoughts to add to this as well? I'll, I'll just briefly add that, um, you know, elk and bison and, and, and cows, are, there are many herd animals and humans are really like that too. And I'm very concerned that um, with the election of our governor Gianforte and his uh, stance on wildlife, um, as Mike has described, um, has uh, empowered in all the wrong ways, uh, a variety of people in the legislature and on the ground um, because now, now, you know, in the dark, dark shadow of former President Trump, there has been this release of, of, of this empowerment of, of doing these, these, these things to wildlife, um, and to people too, um, on social issues. Um, so it's, it's very concerning that now people think, oh, okay, now we can do all those things that we never could before because we had a democratic governor or you know, because we had chosen in the past to be, you know, working across the aisle, reasonable in our state legislatures. 
now they're just letting it loose and it's it's really really unsettling um and i think that all of us who participate in the political system and including ngos have to reassess our strategies about how we're going to participate in these systems now that uh, this seems to be uh, the new normal in these Republican-led um, states and uh, in the future, maybe federally as well. Hmm, thanks, tall order. Um, here's kind of a long question, I'm, and I'm going to ask the, the I, I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, and, and this is some of it you're kind of addressing, but um, this is to both of you as well. It says, this person says, I work extensively with eco travel in Africa where large mammals and carnivores are largely absent outside of protected areas like national parks and conservancies. Education of local populations is a critical component of wildlife conservation there, which helps local communities better understand the value of wildlife and become allies rather than antagonists in conservation efforts. So this is setting up the question of what has been done here in Montana to combat myths, misunderstandings and beliefs by locals about our own large carnivores. Well, I'll, I'll begin and just say that um, there are a lot of different ways to approach these issues, but that's that's one of the major values of community work, such as the coexistence work that you know many are doing, and and, and groups like mine, people and carnivores are doing. Um, you know, one could argue that all of these issues, and I think Mike said something to this um, effect. You know, they're local, and they're becoming more localized in many ways, and so. Um, our field staff lives, they are community members out there and they live and work in those rural communities. And, um, you know, when we work on the ground to solve problems, that creates trust. It's, it's very basic, this stuff on, on one level. Um, and of course, that doesn't necessarily create top-down policies, but it does create bottom-up policies. There are things that can change in terms of laws and regulations from this community work. And when we help people on the ground, I mean, there's just no other way around it. We've got to um, partner with people and we've got to, you know, we can't ignore people in wildlife work because people are the decision makers. And, you know, we also value a lot of the habitat that these large ranches are providing and so forth. But we can't ignore people. And so we've got to collaborate in, in various ways. And, and that's the value of some of this community work. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, and Lisa and her shop have a proven track record that local matters. But the problems are so now systemic that absent uh, a greater number of thoughtful people serving in elected office, we're going to continue to struggle. Uh, I started all of this by saying individual people doing individual things on a daily basis can make a big difference. That's true. Part of that has to be people rising up, gaining election to office and, and earning a seat at the decision-making table where actions are affected that govern the collective behavior of a large group like the state of Montana. Uh, for a long time, for 16 years, there was a great bit of good work done in Helena because there was this balanced tension. There was a democratic governor willing to work with a cabal of thoughtful Republicans and strong caucuses of Democrats in the House and the Senate. And through the work of Governor Schweitzer and then Governor Bullock for 16 years, Montana was able to move to an excited future. All of that went away in the 2020 election. And now you're seeing a raft of ideas being turned into laws that will move Montana in a less excited future. I, I don't want to overstate the importance of elected leaders, but the kind of influence that is affected from the top down really matters. And while I appreciate education, uh, and I can say this because I'm criticizing my tribe 
And I understand that we are all very tribal. Homo sapiens is at its core tribal. I don't wear a big belt buckle. And I don't wear a cowboy hat. And so all of a sudden I'm not in the right tribe, but I am in the old white guy tribe. The old white guy tribe is not good at being educated. We, we, we tend to dig our heels in and become more stubborn in the presence of good information that should prompt us to rethink our position, but we don't. And because the problems are now so acute, I don't believe we have uh, much time. And, and so consequently, given that I don't believe most old white guys are educatable, I think we need different people in positions of authority. I would gladly, if I could have gotten bills passed, passed a bill that said old white guys can't serve an elected office for 100 years. We've had our bite at the apple. We need to get the heck out of the way. I was so proud to sit on the Democratic side of the aisle and I looked down and I saw young people and I saw Native Americans and I saw a majority of women that served the state of Montana very well. There needs to be more of that. In contrast, when I looked on the other side of the room, I saw a bunch of old white guys. And, and it, the, I don't think they have the capacity to serve Montana well going forward. So while I appreciate Lisa's everyday approach, we employ it too. Folks have to engage on a regular basis to ensure that elections turn Montana in a proper direction. Wow. Okay. You've already been thanked by one person for, for a few, uh, former rant. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to thank you for that one. Well, so <laughs> what I'm doing is ranting. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, only in the best possible way. Um, so, so turning directions a little bit, but um, Lisa, you talked about the livestock that are in pens and protecting you know, herds, but is, are there strategies or devices uh, for uh, free ranging livestock? What do we, what, do, what can we do to protect the, the carnivores and the, the, uh, the animals, domestic animals and free ranging? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, that uh, is the most intractable and difficult place and, and scenario um, for coexistence because, um, and, and I'm talking about on public lands. So livestock will go up onto public lands and, and um, you know, during the summer months. And um, there are some solutions uh, that, you know, we're all working on to become more affordable and efficient, such as range riders. So range riders uh, ride, ideally, they ride with the cattle herds um, or herders with sheep um, so that there's a person with the livestock. Um, it's really challenging if um, continuous grazing is used and a rider cannot be even with the livestock it, with the cattle or maybe the sheep, um, although sheep herd more easily. Um, so that's a really challenging situation because then, you know, the, the cattle are spread across 20,000 acres and no one knows where they even are. Um, I think there are some GPS developments or some chips for, um, for cows that, are, that have been developed. And I don't know a lot about them that then um, can help locate them or if someone wants to uh, concentrate them or herd them, they can find them. But, um, but that, that is the single most challenging coexistence scenario um, that, you know, we just haven't figured out yet, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that is, that, that is a good question. Thanks for, for, okay. for the, the attempt at the answer. Well, and could I, <laughs> yes. add, could, yeah. could I add that that to some extent, and I appreciate that Lisa is so thoughtful, but to some extent, maybe we conclude it's not a problem. If you choose a business practice that puts your private property in harm's way willingly on a public landscape, accessing public grass at a fraction of what it would be worth if it was on private land, well, maybe we as a collective say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We appreciate grazing on public lands. We want that to happen. But if you incur losses because you, you did so willingly and the public lands are managed more for more than just the production of grass that you can 
turn into meat and money for with your cattle. Maybe there's there's no real problem that gray wolf can create on public lands. I have said for decades that I support very liberal management of gray wolves on private land. It, it's your property. If there is a problem, we're, we should have a ready re resolution. But conversely, we could argue for very conservative management on public land. You, you don't have to be there. It's not ground that you own. You're buying the grass at a fraction of what it's worth. In, in, part, we, we, in part, we subsidize the, the use of grass. We, the American people, subsidize the use of grass by private ranchers because we want ranching to succeed. We, we as a collective, have said that's, that's a good use of, of tax money. And, and so there's, there's another way to look at it. And, and to some extent on public land, we can have different expectations than might be appropriate for private land. I, That's I'll a just good point. Add, I, 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 I've often wondered that too. Lisa, go ahead. Oh, I just wanna say that I wholeheartedly agree with Mike's comments. Um, and it, it's similar to the compensation programs that exist, which compensate, um, for livestock losses, you know, by wolves, for example. And um, it would be great if the program, if we could change the policy and the program so that, um, you know, operators were required to use prevention before they were able to, you know, file for some compensation funding. Um, so it's a similar idea, we should, we should look at these issues more holistically um, so that so that they make sense and there aren't these so-called moral hazards or or deep inequities favoring one person or another versus the wildlife. Thanks for that clarification. And and Mike, this is a similar question to you, but how does Turner Ranch actively raise bison and not have a problem with the wolves on the ranch? Uh, first and foremost, thank you. That it, it, that's a very insightful question. First and foremost, uh, Ted had enough ecological awareness and knowledge of the Rocky Mountain West to expect that bison as livestock would be nearly impervious to depredations. Uh, gray wolves don't depredate on bison very often because it's not an easy thing to do. Bison are very very difficult to kill. Uh, consequently, the, the amount of depredations on the Flying D Ranch is very, very slight because bison are very, very difficult to kill. E even the really young calves, we've done uh, an extensive study looking at gray wolf bison interactions. We expected young, young neonates, young calves, just a few weeks old, they're, they're red, you, maybe everybody has seen them in Yellowstone Park, the little red calves. We expected that they would be most vulnerable, but our work makes clear they're not the least bit vulnerable. They are never depredated by gray wolves, in part because mom is, the mother cow is so protective that the gray wolves simply don't have an opportunity. The, the bison that has been killed by gray wolves most often on the Flying D are short yearlings, older calves that have molted out of that red coat they're carrying the more traditional darker brown coat. They're six months, eight months, nine months of age. That's a bit of independence. All of a sudden they're comfortable being two, 300 yards away from mom. And that's two, 300 yards of opportunity for a gray wolf. But even then gray wolves are not depredating on bison with any regularity. Uh, so Ted made a very wise livestock choice. We intend to publish a paper soon that makes a simple point if you're going to ranch in large carnivore country, the best livestock is bison. Uh, it's a great deal better than, than cattle, and it's a great deal better than, than sheep. And, and then Ted has accepted the depredations that do occur as just part of the business operation related to ranching in the Rocky Mountain West. Uh, he has said on more than one occasion, we're not going to make the flying D fit us. We will fit the flying D. And the Flying D includes the Bear Trap Pack, which has been present on the ranch since about 2002. Starting about 2008, it was recorded as one of the largest packs in North America, typically including 15 to 25 animals. So it's a large pack that makes extensive use 
of the ranch. It's a fixed feature of the Flying D. And Ted simply accepts the fact that they're there. He's choosing to ranch in that country and there will be some losses. Now, some folks may say, well, gee whiz, Mike, Ted's a billionaire. He can afford it. Well, to some extent, that's very true. But when you cut Ted Turner deep enough, what you find above all else isn't a philanthropist, it's not a conservationist, it's not a hunter, it's not an angler, it's a businessman. You cut Ted Turner deep enough and you bump into a business guy. He insisted from the very beginning that all of these Rocky Mountain ranches be part of a business endeavor. He expects the ranches to be run as serious business operations. So the losses are noted, but it is considered just simply part of life in the Rocky Mountain West. It's amazing. And I know he doesn't just do this in Montana. He does this uh, on properties around the world. So truly, uh, tr truly an enlightened um, businessman. Um, Lisa, this is a question for you. Is there a lot of resistance to the quote unquote new ideas for predator control? The new ideas. Um... I'm not sure what those ideas are. I mean, maybe, are, but... you know, I, I mean, flattery could be a new idea. Okay. I mean, there might be yeah. people that haven't heard of these, yep. you know, so. So these, uh, these coexistence tools. How, how are you working assume, that? Yeah. I'm going to assume the new ideas are these these tools um, or, or just the approach of trying to prevent conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right. There, there is, there is some resistance um, out there. Uh, there are some people who, will not try these tools because they don't want to help wild carnivores. And so they're willing to sort of uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is a horrible metaphor. I'm not, you know, but, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not willing to solve their own problems because they don't want to help wildlife. Um, but, but we find that um, they're sort of, and then they're on the other end, they're the early adopters, so to speak. Who are, who are really willing to try these new ideas. And I think most are somewhere between those two so-called extremes um, or you know, sort of in the middle and um, willing to try new things. Um, many of them are wanting to sleep better at night. Many of them you know, are willing to uh, try new things because we're offering it to them. You know, there's a whole economic picture to this as well. And I think there might've been a question asked about that too, um, because the funding of all of these, these solutions um, can be challenging. And um, what we do is we try to cost share or get some investment by every landowner that we work with, but that can't always happen, especially when we are very motivated in a particular area to prevent conflicts. And so, um, you know, people will accept, um, accept help when it's offered to them, um, but many are um, willing to at least explore whether these tools will work. So the answer is yes, there is resistance, of course, um, but it's being slowly broken down and we'll never break all of it down, you know, but, um, but I think these tools are becoming more popular um, as people see that they work. You know, and that's that's leads to this next question of, you know, how and who was it? How is it discovered that the flagery uh, deters wolves? I mean, it, and and I had a separate question that I'm going to ask along with that. But does color matter? Color does not flagery? matter. They don't see color. <laughs> oh, okay. They don't, they don't see color. They see the movement. And, um, but that's a great question. Um, so the flags could be, could be gray and, and some ranchers prefer for them not to be red. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, I, and I, to be honest, I, and may, maybe Mike knows the history of Fladry. I don't know the, the, the far back history of Fladry. There have been a lot of studies on it though, even in this country. Um, and it's been shown to work. Um, and my guess is it originated in, in some other country. <laughs> you're, you're muted, Mike. I'm muted, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lisa, your instincts are spot on. It originated in Europe uh, 
centuries ago as a method for hunting wolves. They would, they would, they would know of wolf activity in a small woodlot, for example, and they would, they would en encompass some of that woodlot with these strips of flagging and, and they, they could drive wolves in a specific direction because the animals showed this sharp tendency to not violate that border defined by these strips of flagging. It, it's, an, it's an odd thing that gray wolves would just blow right through it. Uh, but they don't, at least upon early uh, detection, that there's something about the novelty of it all that works. But it originated in Europe a long time ago as a means for hunting wolves. Thanks, Mike. So I'm going to keep on you. Somebody asked, what are the opportunities for constituents to influence legislatures? Well. Legislators. <laughs> And I wish, I wish I, my, my, my computer shows 46 participants and there's four of us that are part of the administration of this. So there's 42 folks. I wish I could be more encouraging to the 42. And I will say that I am somewhat biased. I was honored to serve in the legislature for 14 years. I got really good at introducing bills that died in committee. So <laughs> now to be fair, to be fair, I was always in the minority and, and uh, in the presence of a great deal of needless partisanship, being in the minority could be something of a slog. Uh, I, I wish I could say that public participation matters a great deal. Idealistically, the answer to that would be yes, of course it does. And I'm sure in many cases it does. Uh, and so first and foremost, you, you need to stay in touch with your elected officials so they know full well that they're working for you and, and they should be responsive to the needs of their constituents and then the needs of their community and then ultimately the needs of the state. That, that's the tried and true approach. Uh, I, I think even more fundamental to that, and I will say when I got beat in my first campaign in 2004, uh, after that campaign for the next 18, 20 months, I was I did talk radio. I was the lone progressive voice in AM 1450K MMS. That's back in the day when Open Range was on the show. It was every Friday afternoon from 46, we had a drive time show. And, and uh, I, I, I began to acknowledge on air that it was really sad that there was so little public participation. And, and someone called and said, yeah, no, the most important thing that, that we as citizens can do is vote. I said, no, that's not true. That's a cop out. The most important thing we can do as citizens is cast an informed vote. That's hard. It's hard to cast an informed vote. So first and foremost, that's a great way to contribute. Invest enough in your government and the issues to cast an informed vote. Secondly, make sure your legislators are doing their job. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, find the time to put your name on a ballot and earn a seat at the decision-making table. We need different people in office. I, I thought it was an insult. I, th I think highly of the Republican Party. I'm proud to be a Democrat, but I am convinced the state of Montana and the United States is best off when the Republican Party brings its A game because it forces Democrats to bring their A game. And A games are good things. There was nothing about Donald Trump that spoke well of the Republican Party. How that all happened, I have no idea. It, it can't be a function of informed votes. It just can't. So, so I think above all else, people need to continue to engage. I think we get exactly the government we deserve. I agree. I've got a couple of our questions here before we wrap up, but one of them is, um, are we making progress in reducing human wildlife conflict? We, we are making progress. Um, and it will take a lot of work to keep up with ongoing development, you know? Um, so that it's a, it is a battle because as people move into these rural areas, we have to keep scaling up this work. Um, but I, I have been doing this, well, I've been working in this, this kind of work for about 15 years and I've been leading people in carnivores for 10 years. And I can honestly say that in the 10 years in this organization, I have seen immense change in terms of growing momentum and culture change. Now, is it still, there's a long way to go, um, but there have been years when there has been a clear sense of a growing momentum in terms of 
these growing networks and, and more landowners using conflict prevention tools, more organizations getting involved in various ways. Um, so it, it, there is no doubt in my mind that um, it is catching on, it is growing, it is scaling. Um, it's not as fast as we want it to be, um, but uh, we're getting there. Eventually, what will need to happen is a large funding mechanism will need to exist. I personally feel that it will have to be a private one, um, but to start, we need some government resources to shift from certain activities to prevention activities, um, because there's a lot of money in monitoring and lethal control and other things. And if we'd shifted some of that, redirected some of that funding towards more lethal control, and some agencies are doing this, so it's happening. Um, uh, we need to get more resources there. Um, and, but, but in, in any case, it is absolutely growing and it's, it's, it's a good thing. So a helpful attendee said people can give money and support to people and carnivores and oh. posted your link. <laughs> yeah. we, we've got that. active people here. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So Lisa, I have a question for you. Is there a map um, of where those bear poles are uh, in, in, um, for hikers? Ah, well, um, no, there is not. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, but bear poles, well, I mean, I, I think there are probably ways if contacting the agency is, in fact, I know there are ways to find out where the bear poles are. Um, I don't know of a map, so it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, mm -hmm. and I don't know if the, the question is referring to the bear poles that we have built. There's not a map of our bear poles, but there are bear poles all over, they're in the national parks, they're in the national parks at every camp, campsite. Um, right. And I'm sure the US Forest Service um, could inform people where the bear, bear poles are. When you go into um, the areas, we do put signage on trees so that people can find them. Um, we haven't created our own map, but one may exist. Mm -hmm. Well, just personally, that'd be helpful because I like to go with my daughter because she can climb yeah. trees to hang our, our, yeah, our bear bags. A, so, having, yes, thank you. Pull. Yeah, thanks. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, the last question is how do you, and I don't know if you, how you guys answer this, but how do you eliminate or change these social constructs on animals? That's a, that's a big one. Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, well, I think we make, we've talked about, I'll be brief. Um, we've talked about this a little bit. Changes at the local level can be very helpful. Um, creating social tolerance um, by being proactive um, and slowly creating some bottom-up policies, but also as Mike has mentioned, working, working, effortlessly on the top-down policies as well. Um, we need all of these efforts combined. I'm sorry, Paul, what was the question? Oh, I, of course you just asked me, I just closed it out, Mike, oh, hold sorry. on, I can, but it's, how, do you, how, do you, how do you change the social constructs on wildlife? Well, uh, because I have uh, less and less faith in in adults to change their minds. Uh, I think if you really want to affect change, let's assume that you really, that this is a very serious endeavor, you want to affect change. You do it with children so they grow up with a different perspective and they hold it tight as an adult. How, how do you do that? You know, I, you get kids out, I reckon. You, you get them off the doggone screen and phones and all that other stuff and you get them outside. And that's not easy to do. I, I get it. I've got four kids and Annabelle spends entirely too much time on her screen and not enough time with her chickens. But if you really want to affect change, I think young people who haven't yet firmed their perspective of the world is a great way to go. I, I worry that we don't have that amount of time. Uh, some of these issues are pressing down so firmly now that time is not our ally. 
And, and so I go back to imagining not only the beautiful work of people in carnivores, but then the other work that looks at the perspective from the top down and try to put in place different decision makers. I will say, for example, President Biden has shown a keen interest in actually functionally addressing things like climate change. It was amazing to me that he said, I will have as part of my cabinet, a position that celebrates science. Wow. And, and, and you know, we, we throw the word science around, but fundamentally I've thought about this a lot as a conservation scientist, but people can argue that, and I would, that science is simply the systematic accumulation of reliable knowledge. Who's gonna argue with that? Why would anybody argue against the systematic accumulation of reliable knowledge? Biden made a part of his cabinet. He put in place a, a climate czar that's gonna focus on that issue 25 hours a day. That's great. It's a great shift at the highest levels of our national government. So I, I believe that bottom up matters. I believe that top down matters. I believe if you're really after truly uh, persistent systemic changes, children matter. Thanks. So to end here, I, um, for our audience, I asked Lisa and Mike if they had any books that they would recommend or, or that they were reading and they have provided a couple of them each. Um, the Country Bookshelf has those right now for purchase. They have a shelf and they have put up that these are recommendations. So we encourage everybody to support our Main Street business. Um, the library will also have these books. Um, Lisa, I'm going to ask you about one of your books, Down from the Mountain, The Life and Death of a Grizzly Bear by Bryce Andrews. And what, you know, why did you recommend that book? Can you tell us about it? Well, um, this is almost cheating because this book was written by one of um, People in Carnivore's staff members, um, but it is a wonderful book. It has won, it has won many awards and is, I can tell is being widely read because um, uh, we are contacted by many people who, who are reading the book. And it basically um, goes through um, a story of this grizzly bear and her cubs that occurred on, we learned about this bear on one of our projects. And so uh, the book talks about um, some of the people in carnivores work, um, but, but more so in the bigger picture, the complexities of um, natural resource management, wildlife management, trying to make a living on the land in, in the modern West. And so I think it's a really um, interesting story on the one hand, and then an al also a really nice uh, depiction of the realities of what it means to live out here in the Intermountain West and, and make a living off the land and also um, seek to conserve wildlife. Well, thanks. I'm, gonna, I'm definitely gonna check that out. And then Mike, you um, chose two books, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life by Edward O. Wilson. And I think many of us are familiar with E.O. Wilson, um, but it's the, the next book, The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating by Elizabeth Tova Bailey. And that has to be hands down one of the best titles I've ever read. So, so what, Mike, can you tell us about that book and why you recommended it? Well, it's consistent with recommending Ed's book. Ed, Ed's a pal and a hero of mine, and Half Earth helps us understand the scale across which our conservation efforts need to operate. But at Ed's core, he would align with the sound of a wild snail eating because the natural world is magnificent in its simplicity. And not only is the author a fantastic writer, well, it celebrates the, the simple beauties that we can find all around us, even in the form of a common snail. And, and it quite simply, you know, we spent most of this discussion thinking about big things, gray wolves and grizzly bears, but it's the little things that run the world. It's the snails of the world that, that run the world. And, and it's, it's a book that helps us understand that nature is marvelous because she operates across 
a multitude of scales. And many of the most important are right in front of us if we just took the time to notice. That book, I hope people will read it and will be uh, reminded of the value of noticing. Well, thanks so much. And um, I will say that, uh, Mike, you were thanked um, for your rants. And um, Lisa, you have been thanked for being composed, logical, and calm. Oh, huh. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, another, yeah, another thing that came in said, fantastic job by Lisa and Mike today and all their work for wildlife and conservation. So I um, echo that um with with all of our attendees and we really appreciate uh both you and mike joining us and i want to um to, to just applaud your work and and know that it is recognized and it is um very much appreciated here in southwest montana um in, in our gallatin valley so so thanks thanks to both of you um, and then finally, I just want to remind folks, thank you for joining us. And we have on May 13th, the Bozeman Public Library Symposium on Mental Health and Wellness during this time of COVID and the pandemic. And on May 19th, uh, Mike, we're going to talk about some of the things that, that uh, you were speaking of. And um, the title is, uh, What Happened in Helena? <laughs> And uh, so if you want to know, I will, we, will, we will learn. Um, and that's with the folks at the, the editors and writers at the Montana Free Press. And that's noon on May 19th for our final library community forum of the year. So again, thank you guys so much. I'm getting more notices. Wonderful job by panelists. Fascinating and motivating information. Thank you. A pleasure to listen to the presentation today. Thank you. Outstanding presentation. So um, this is, you know, really, really top notch and the, the library and all of um, my committee members, thank you guys for joining us and, and for taking the time. So keep thank up you. the good work. Keep up the good work. We need to, uh, you know, thank preach you. to the choir sometimes. And yep. <laughs> so thanks, Beth. And we look forward to seeing you guys all next month. Bye bye. <laughs>